Well, good afternoon. Hope everybody's having a great Sabbath day. Uh, I have to confess, when when Darren started that sermon, he's going to tell a story about Quentin. <laughs> My brother's named Quentin. I had no idea where this sermon might go. Bit of a relief where it did go, so that's good. Um, we have some uh, competing variables in the sermon link today. I've got more notes and really fit in a split sermon. But this computer achieved obsolescence recently also, and the battery is eight years old, and hopefully it makes it through, but if it doesn't, you no, know, we may have a very abrupt ending to the sermon. That's all right. Use the time we got wisely, something kind of similar to uh, a little bit of what Darren was talking about, which I really appreciated the, uh, the first sermon. It's going to tie in very nicely with what we're going to talk about here uh, in this sermon, and uh, you know, God's people have always been a very extreme minority on the face of this planet. There aren't very many of us. I mean, look around the room here. This is not a large congregation. And then you start to think about this is probably one of the larger congregations in the United Church of God. It's probably in the top 50 percentile, I would, I would imagine, for congregation size in the United Church of God. Uh, there's just not a whole lot of us around in this world. We've always been eventually small, a very insignificant people compared to the masses of the world around us. And sometimes it's really easy for us to look around at the billions and billions of people in this world and to see the few people in this room and to know how few the people are throughout the world, scattered throughout the world, whom God has truly called and opened their eyes and their minds to understanding. And sometimes it's easy to Think about the disparity in those numbers and be a little bit apprehensive because we get apprehensive sometimes about being so tiny, being so small, being so weak, such a small people. And especially when we look at the encroaching government uh, overreach on the freedoms that we have historically enjoyed in this nation, we can easily see what can be coming down the road for us, which is not a surprise, by the way, shouldn't surprise us. It's been in this scripture for a long, long time, what's coming down the road for God's people, ultimately. And that can make us a little bit nervous, because what power do we have to stand in the face of massive governments that may not agree with the way that God thinks. So in this uh, regard, brethren, in many ways, we find ourselves in a similar situation to the Jewish people in the second half of the 6th century BC. The Jews, of course, were taken captive in the first half of the 6th century, and by 586, 585, thereabouts BC. Nebuchadnezzar came in, raised the city, raised the temple to the ground, and that was the end of the Judean people as a political entity. That was the end of any Israelite tribes as a political entity in the world. And Nebuchadnezzar put an end to the Jewish kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. But the Babylonian Empire, for all of its greatness, really didn't last that long. After just a few decades, it flamed out. In short order, the Persians under Cyrus came in in about 539 BC. Cyrus took Babylon, going in under the city gates, under the gates, through the river, when he diverted the riverbed. And Cyrus, in very short order then, issued the decree within a year. He issued the famous decree that we can find at the very end of 2 Chronicles, at the beginning of Ezra, where he said any Jew that wanted to could go back up out of Babylon and go up to Jerusalem and to build the house of their God. That is the decree that Cyrus, just very quickly, after he took over, after he expanded and took over the Babylonian holdings, very quickly he issued that decree. And so a remnant, a tiny fraction of all the Jews that had been scattered all throughout the, the region by that time, throughout the nations, they made that trek from Babylon back to Jerusalem to go and build that temple. Now, when they came back there, uh, not everyone was happy to see them return. 
because they've been gone for 50, 60, 70 years. And in the interim, other peoples had moved in. And in particular, the Samaritans weren't very happy to see the Jews coming back to Jerusalem. Uh, they had enemies, people who did not want to share the land, which just goes to show you, some things never change, do they? <laughs> some things are never going to change until the return of Jesus Christ. When we go to Ezra 3, we'll pick it up in Ezra 3, talking about this, and we see how the Jews got to work building the temple. And around 537 B.C., they got off to a good start. They uh, went to work hard, and about a year, year or so later, the start of their second year there, they completed the foundation for the new temple to all this great fanfare that we read about in Ezra 3. Many, many of us are familiar with this story. So when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with their trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the eternal after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising, giving thanks unto the eternal because he is good for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the eternal because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So tremendous excitement at completing the first step, a very important step, laying the foundation of rebuilding the temple. The temple's on its way now. And the people are rejoicing and they're shouting with joy. Trumpets are sounding, cymbals are clanging. But not everyone can find the happiness in the situation, not everyone can see the joy in what's taking place on this occasion. In verse 12, but many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men. So these were old men who had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes. They wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. So the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. So you have this bipolar reaction to what's going on when the foundation is laid for this temple. Uh, you have many of the people who are just ecstatic at what it might represent, but then you have the really old timers, the really old folks there who had been in Jerusalem 50 years earlier, 60 years earlier, maybe even during the time of Josiah, 70 years or so before this. Now, those in the Josiah's day would have seen the temple in all of its glory. I mean, the temple worship Josiah restored it with a vengeance. Very bright, vibrant uh, temple, a very vibrant city there in Jerusalem. And they look back upon that. They couldn't find the joy in the day because they knew what that temple had once been. And they knew what Jerusalem had once been. And they had seen that temple in its heyday and in its glory. And they had seen that city when it was thriving and prosperous and filled with life. And now in front of them is this tiny little foundation. And surrounding them is a city filled with ruins. And God knew what these older folks were thinking. I mean, God had seen Solomon's temple too. God knew this was not a large foundation. We go back to Haggai 2. Haggai 2, where God is talking about this foundation of the temple, the reaction of the, uh, the people. Haggai squeezed between Zephaniah and Zechariah. So the way you can remember the last, what, five books of the, uh, the, uh, the Minor Prophets, you got, you got Habakkuk. H, Zephaniah, Z, Haggai, H, Zechariah, Z, and then Malachi is the last one. That's easy to remember. So, uh, but anyway, Haggai's back there, the third last book from the Old Testament. Haggai 2 and in verse 3. Uh, God knew what they were thinking because he says, he says, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So God know, knew that a human being who had once seen Solomon's temple there in Jerusalem, would now look at this new temple's foundation, would compare the two and say, this is absolutely nothing. This thing is tiny. How are we ever going to institute temple worship the way it needs to be? Because let me tell you, in my day, I knew what temple worship really was and how it should be. 
You guys are never going to get anything done with this thing. Simply too small. So small, so insignificant. I'm not even sure this thing is worthwhile building. Almost no value at all to them. In comparison, as nothing. Well, Zechariah 4. Zechariah 4. Which, if you remember what I just said, you'll know where to find Zechariah. As I turn the wrong direction in my Bible. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Do we really think that God is concerned with the size of the temple? Do we really think that? Do we think God really cares what the size of the temple is? Do we for one second think that is what matters to God? And in Zechariah, God speaks to this temple, and he speaks to the thoughts that he knows some of these people have towards that temple. Zechariah 4 and in verse 10. God says, For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hands of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the eternal which run to and fro through the whole earth. And so God is telling us, or telling these Jews in the day time of Zechariah, who wept at the laying the foundation of the second temple, and who no doubt were going around telling everyone who would listen about how small and useless this new temple was going to be. And God is telling them, the day is coming, not far off in their future, when they're going to see that temple completed, and they're going to see what a wonderful thing it is, and they're going to rejoice when Zerubbabel, the governor, holds that plumb line down from the headstone and sees that that temple is sitting plumb upon its foundation, and that is solidly built, and it's strong, and it's level, and it's sure. Just a small thing, a little thing. But God says there is tremendous value in that. I want to talk about the small things today. I mean, every now and again in the Church of God, you'll have a sermon you'll hear entitled The Day of Small Things, where we read this verse and we give a sermon about this verse. But I never have, so I wanted to today. And every sermon is a little bit different, the approach. I want to talk about the small things today, brethren, and... I want to get started by talking about dirt. I think it was a couple years ago, Jim gave a message. Uh, I think the message was on dirt. I remember it, dirt's what stuck with me about the message. Okay, It was a good message. <laughs> um, it's a fascinating topic. I want to get started talking about that. In particular, I want to get started in Genesis 3, right where we were with the, uh, the earlier split sermon. Uh, the dirt of Genesis 3, because it's good for us to remember where we came from. And where we all came from is good old dirt. That's where we came from. Genesis 3, verse 19, and again in the aftermath of the, uh, that first human sin. In verse 19, God tells Adam, he says, In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread you, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. That kind of helps me to understand how small of a thing I am when I read this scripture here. It helps me to remember that I'm dirt. And as long as I remember that I'm dirt, I tend not to get too uppity with anybody when I can remember that. I think a lot of my problems in my relationships probably begin when I forget I'm dirt. It's probably where a lot of the problems begin. And dirt is all that I am. And there's not a single thing that I can do to change that fact. I cannot change the fact that I am dirt and I cannot change the fact that one day I'm going to return to the dirt from which I was taken. 
I can't change that. Only God can change that. And God, he doesn't even have to change it. Right? God will either elect to do that, or he won't. It's not in my power. There's nothing I can do to make God intervene to prevent me from going back to dirt. Right? God makes the decision. Now, God will base that decision upon how I respond to it. But I can't force him to make the decision. Now, thankfully, though, we can turn to Luke 4. And we can see that God does elect to do that. But again, there are those conditions under which he will elect to do that. He won't change the fact that we are made out of dirt, that we are dirt, and that dirt is all we will ever be. He won't change that for just anyone. Rather, there are cer certain conditions of the heart that must be met before God will change the fact that we will never be anything but dirt. I don't know, that's probably bad semantics because it's not a fact if it could be anyway. There are certain conditions of the heart to which God will respond. And he talks about that. Here in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel of, to the poor. So again, Jesus Christ here at the beginning of his ministry, not long after he was baptized there in the Jordan River by John, as we were listening to in the first sermon. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And so here's the gospel that God gives to Jesus Christ to introduce, to bring to humanity. And who is it that gospel message it's going to? Who is the good news of the salvation work that God is doing in humanity? Who does it go to? It goes to the poor. It goes to the brokenhearted. It goes to the captives. It goes to the blind. It goes to the bruised. We won't go through every one of those words here, but that word for poor... In the Greek is tokas, tokas, which means complete poverty. A beggar who is out there on the street who has absolutely nothing and with no way of getting anything. And all they can do is beg. So they have nothing. Going to the brokenhearted. Santribo in the Greek. From the root santribo, which means to crush completely. Something that is shattered. So who's this message going to? It's going to the small things of the earth, isn't it? Christ has come to give a gospel message to a, to a people who are completely destitute. To a people who are completely shattered in spirit. And think about, you know, where Christ is, is quoting from here. He's quoting from the book of Isaiah, looking at the immediate aftermath of the greatest apocalypse the world will ever see. He's talking about that kind of people to a time where every single human life on the face of the planet will perish and everyone will know that it's about to perish. That they're all going down, whoever's left. And they'll know that. They will know they have absolutely nothing left. 
they will know that they live in a world that is completely shattered, that they are completely shattered with no possibility of human recovery. They will know that the only recourse they have is to do some begging with someone that can change all that. That's who Jesus Christ is bringing this message to. They will know that they and everything around them is beyond hope and they will know it because they will have nothing left and they will see that there is nothing in them to deliver themselves. They will know how small they are. That they're just dirt. And they're all about to go back to the dirt. And brethren, every single one of us have to come to that point somehow in our lives to understand how weak we are, how base we are, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. We have to come to that point before we can receive this message. In Luke 4. Jesus Christ comes to us and he tells us that he has a message for us. But not everyone has a heart to receive that message. Not everyone can understand it. Not everyone can receive it because it is a message for those who are destitute and who know that they are destitute, for those who are shattered and who know that they are shattered, to those who are broken and know that they are hopelessly broken. To those who know that they are the very small things, and we all are because we're made out of dirt. I mean, there's not a whole lot that we should expect out of ourselves when we're made out of dirt when it comes to living forever. It's incredible to me we live at all. What a miracle. Just be thankful. God decided he wanted to do something with that dirt. He wanted to do something with that pile of dirt. But when we get into the right frame of mind, when we realize and understand how very small that we really are, when we understand that we are the small dust of the balance of the world, then God can begin to do a work in us. And then he can begin to reach us with his message. And let's think about this message. Do you see what it is that he is coming and he is preaching here? He is preaching what? The acceptable year of the Lord. Now what does that mean? That means to be accepted by God. That's what he's coming to us with. A tiny tiny people living in a great big world and God has come to you with this message and to me where he tells us I will accept you once you understand what you really are because we have to understand what we really are because we won't listen if we don't think we need it we won't. We won't bother listening. We won't really pay attention to what God has to say to us if we don't understand how small we are and how weak we are and how hopeless we are. We are the small things, and this is where our relationship with God has to begin. Isaiah 66, we're all the small things. Isaiah 66. Now, once we come to this realization about ourselves, when we really begin to understand how small we are, when we really begin to understand that because of not just what we've done, but because of who and what we are, that we're completely destitute and damaged beyond any repairing of it of, our, of ourselves. We understand how deeply we need God and we're just the beggars out there on the street. 
because we have nothing. When we understand that, then God will begin to do something absolutely remarkable in our lives. Isaiah 66, verse 1. Thus says the Eternal, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things has my hand made, and all those things have been, says the Eternal. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. God's dwelling place. It's with the same poor that Jesus came to preach the gospel message to, to the contrite, to those who are willing to change, who tremble at his word. That's what God's looking for. We're talking about here the dwelling place of God. That's what God's talking about here. He starts out talking about the dwelling place of God. He says, you know what? Out of all the inner universe, there isn't anything that anyone can build for me. I don't care how big or small the temple is. It doesn't matter. Because God is vastly greater than all of that anyway. He said, there isn't anything you can build for me that even makes sense because I've already made the whole universe. And if he wanted something bigger and better, he would make that too. That isn't what God wants. He doesn't want some huge, ostentatious temple. He doesn't want something bigger and better than this universe to live in. He doesn't want that. What does he say he wants? He wants your heart. He wants our hearts is what he wants. He wants us to go and to read these scriptures and to understand what they're really saying to us and to revere him enough and to love him enough that we will actually do. That we will actually do the things that he tells us to do. Not to ignore it, not to rationalize it away and decide that God doesn't really mean it or that it's not really expected of us or it's not really important. God wants our hearts so that we read his word and we revere him enough and we love him enough that we do the things he instructs us to do. He wants us to hear him and to serve him as we heard in the first sermon. Ezra 5, there's kind of an interesting exchange where the Samaritans who really hated the Jews they wanted to come and see what the Jews were doing there in Jerusalem. Um, you know, there's a period of time there where the enemies of the Jews had written to uh, Cyrus's successor, Cambyses. They had actually stopped the work on the temple. Cambyses forbade it. But now uh, Darius was now the king. So we went from Cyrus to Cambyses to Darius at this point. This is around 520. This is around the time that Haggai and Zechariah <clears throat> were on the scene prophesying. Um, so the, the work on the temple had started back up after a time of dormancy. And so the Samaritans and the other enemies of the Jews there in the area, they come to Jerusalem to see this activity that's going on because they're going to make sure they tell the king all about it, just like they did with Cambyses. And they're going to let Darius now know what this rebellious and bad city, that's how they, that's how they, they, uh, they say it in the letter, it's funny to me, this rebellious and bad city, um, what these Jews were up to. And not only that, they weren't just going to send a letter, they were going to take names and send the letter to the principal about what was going on here. So in Ezra 5 and in verse 9, the Samaritans, some of the other enemies come to the Jews, talk to the Jews about what's going on here. And uh, verse 9 says, uh, and this is the Samaritans who are talking here. The people who sent the letters to Darius are speaking here. said, then we asked those elders, that means the elders of the Jews, the, the Samaritans asking the elders of the Jews, we said thus unto them, who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? We asked their names also to certify you that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. And thus, this is the answer they gave to us. They said, so they asked the Jews, who are you? And the Jews say, we are the servants of the God of heaven 
and earth. And this house is his house. We are his servants. We're building his house. You know, if somebody asks us who we are, or if we ask ourselves, who am I? Some mornings we may be in that a little confused about things, about life, and who are we really? Just like Darren said in the first split sermon. We are the servants of God. And we are here to build the temple of God. And it's true that we are the small things, just like this Jewish colony here who had recently returned from their captivity in Babylon. So small, a tiny people surrounded by enemies, a people terribly lacking in resources. They, I don't even know if they had enough livestock to even do the, the sacrifices in the temple or not. Maybe they did by this time. It's been 18 years, I guess. But a poor people. We are the poor. We are the destitute. We are the spiritually broken by our sins and the things we've done that we cannot make right. Unring the bell, like Darren said. Can't do that. We're all those things. But none of that matters. Because God's brought a message into our lives. And he's brought a work and a purpose into our lives. And he tells us to do it. A message of salvation for all those who are broken and destitute and blind, those who are imprisoned, enslaved by sin and have no one can set them free in the human realm. Once God brings us to the point that we understand that about ourselves and he will set us free and he will give us sight and he will give us healing and he will give us a work to do in us and to do through us, and brethren, he will accept us into a covenant relationship with him. That changes everything. That makes us into the servants of the God of heaven and earth. To build his house, and more than just building his house, brethren, to become his house. Like he told us in Isaiah 66. With those who are contrite and tremble at his word, where Jesus Christ, God the Father, will come and they will live in us if we live with them. They will live in us. And if we are the contrite of spirit, if we tremble at his word, if we do love him and show him the reverence to him. And sincerely seeking to obey him. So here we are, the smallest of all the small things upon the earth, and yet God has chosen us to be his dwelling place, to build his temple, to be the servants of Almighty God. Zechariah 4, you know, we don't do any of this, <laughs> none of this happens through our own strength. In Zechariah 4, God makes it very clear. It doesn't matter how small the temple might be. It doesn't matter how small the people are. It doesn't matter how small we are. God already knows we're very small. He already knows we're very I mean, God's the one that pulled us out of the world in the first place. Of course, he's aware of how small we are. He knows that we are weak. He knows that we are helpless and hopeless without his intervention, just clods of dirt. He knows all of that. He made us. And it doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters is what God can do with a clod of dirt. That's what matters. Zechariah 4, and in verse 6, then he answered and he spoke to me, saying, This is the word of the Eternal unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Eternal of hosts. 
None of us are ever going to build anything in our lives of our own power, of our own might. Just like these Jews who came up from Babylon to go to Jerusalem, we're never going to come out of Babylon, go back to their old land, and build anything there. I mean, first of all, they had to have the king release them to do it. They couldn't even get out of Babylon to do it themselves. They had to have the resources given to them to do it. They had to have the intervention of the authorities of the day to keep their enemies that surrounded them from destroying them. Just a tiny remnant of the people. Not a lot of money. Not a lot of power. They were never going to build that temple on their own. Just brethren, just like you and me, are never going to build the temple of God on our own. We're too small. It's not by our power. It's not by our might. Or not by anything else we might bring to the table that's going to build up this dwelling place of God. It's only through God's Spirit dwelling inside of us. And only that, and brethren, if we don't have that, then we'll never be anything but dirt. If we don't have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us, brethren, then we will never be the temple of God individually. We will never be the temple of God collectively. And we have to do whatever it takes so that God and Jesus Christ will dwell in us. Whatever discipline it takes each day so that God can dwell in. Verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. He shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. And all the obstacles in our lives, brethren, are removed. I don't care how hard it seems. I don't care how daunting it seems. I don't care how scary it seems. It's not by our power or our might, but by the Spirit of God dwelling in us. And let me tell you, the Jews had... A lot of mountains in their way. They had the whole Persian Empire in their way. God turned that. So they could build that temple. God, brethren, achieves everything in us. As long as we understand we are the small things and the beggars who desperately need us. And it's through the power of God that he builds this temple. Let's turn back over to Haggai there in Haggai 2. It's through the power of God that he lives in us through his Holy Spirit. And he will fill this temple with glory. He'll fill this, he'll make a temple that the world's never seen before. So in the book of Haggai, God makes it clear, one of the things he makes clear to the Jews there is that they need to get back to work building the temple. This is the time now, today is the time every day to build the temple. And he reveals what he will do, not with that small temple in Haggai's time there in Jerusalem, because that temple was just a symbol of a much greater work that God's doing, of a future work that God is doing. He's pointing us toward the far greater temple that he will bring and that he is building upon this earth. Haggai 2 and verse 3. We read that. So who's left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So here are the small things. And God says, do not despise the small things. Do not worry about the numbers of people in the church. Do not worry about how small you may be individually. I mean, I understand. I am completely unequipped to navigate this world without somebody looking after me. It's just too hostile of a world. That's okay. The numbers don't matter. Our weaknesses don't matter. It's God dwelling in us. It's what matters. Verse 4. 
Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, says the Eternal, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Eternal, and work. Get to work. For I am with you, says the Eternal of hosts. And that's what matters. That makes a majority when God is with us. And brethren, you and I can be as strong as we need to be in this hostile world that we live in. When God is with us, working in us, and we are doing the work that God has called us to do. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, fear not. So this is God's beautiful faithfulness here. It had been about a thousand years almost since they had come out of Egypt. They had been destroyed as a national entity, and God says, but I haven't forgotten the covenant I made with you. God doesn't forget us. His promises are sure, they are true, they are faithful. Now, we might break the covenant. God never will. He never will break that relationship that he has with his children. He is faithful, he is perfect love, and he will never forget us. He will never forsake us. He never will. We can, we can walk away from him. But he'll never forsake us. Verse 6. For thus says the eternal of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. That's Jesus Christ, by the way, the desire of all nations. The desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the eternal of hosts. So we are looking at something far in the future here from when he was writing these words in Haggai. Looking to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Looking to a different kind of temple. To fill that house with glory. Verse 8, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the eternal of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, says the eternal of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the eternal of hosts. God owns this world. He owns this universe. He made it. He will do with it. What he wants. And this is what he wants. This is what he wants. What he wants is to return his son to this earth and to fill the house of God with glory unlike anything that anyone has ever seen on this planet. He says and the, the Shekinah glory a very few times in biblical history, you see where it's recorded, where God dwelt in the tabernacle or in the temple, and the Shekinah glory just burst forth. Overwhelming everything around. And God says the glory of this future temple that he is building will surpass that. When tens of thousands of family members in the family of God glorified, spiritually resurrected beings gathered in Jerusalem with Jesus Christ around that temple. We cannot even conceive. There is nothing in our frame of reference to help us understand what that could look like and what that will feel like. Incredible glory. And God has called you to be a part of that. He's called us the small things. Pieces of dirt. But pieces of dirt that the eternal creator God of the universe is working in. And will dwell in through his spirit if we dwell with him. Pieces of dirt that God can do anything with. And he will. 